this stuff. All right, this is Moglia. Uh, this, I, I can't remember. Uh, Bulma. Bulma, you have a weird name. <laughs> um, and then we have uh, Louie over there off to the side who's not participating. Um, this is our roadmap to success for these dogs. Now, we, they had a long list of things we want to work on, but frankly, we had to really go back to basics for these dogs. They really had absolutely no respect for their guardians as authority figures. Um, I think your dog probably did a little bit more than the other two. Not trying to blow smoke, but she seems to listen to him a little bit better. And when you only have I one dog, her. well, when you only have one dog, sometimes you have a better, closer relationship with that one dog. So, but basically all the dogs are competing for attention. They're jockeying for position. And my concern, my biggest concern is really Louie because he's, uh, he's trying to correct the humans, and, uh, which he hasn't really done, but once he was challenged a little bit, and not in a comfort, in a domination sort of way, but he was challenged a little bit, and he did kind of push back. So the way we, I uh, try to adjust this is by changing the leader-follower dynamic through rules, boundaries, and limits. That structure helps dogs start to see and identify humans as more authority figures if your timing, consistency, and correct and repetition is good. Dogs learn through timing, consistency, and repetition. repetition. Come. Good job, buddy. Um, I like those ears. That was very nice and polite. I know you've just seen if I have treats in my pocket. I do not. I just have the smell of treats. <laughs> um, so if we uh, are consistently enforcing rules, the dogs see us in a leadership capacity. We have a tendency to think, well, I bought you. I'm the human. I'm clearly the leader. They need to see us answer the door and move them away and control the situation. Control the feeding scenario. Not allow them to invade our personal space. Controlling access to uh, the higher the height of the couch because the higher a dog sits, the more rank or status they have. All of these things give us an opportunity to demonstrate to the dogs that I have the leadership situation handled, and your services are no longer required. We're essentially demoting them. So um, some of the rules we suggest: no furniture, sitting at the door, uh, having to sit and wait for permission to eat their food, uh, not being allowed to be in between the, the little table and the couch here, uh, not being able to invade the human's personal space without invitation, not being able to climb up on the humans. Uh, these sort of things will help the dog start to see and respect us a little bit more better. I'd also like to see the guardians uh, putting an emphasis on rewarding the dogs for desired actions and behaviors, and I do this through my petting with the perfect technique. Um, so if the dog nudges you, instead of petting the dog and following the dog's orders, we're going to tell the dog to sit or to lie down. And once it sits, we're going to pet it under the chin if possible and say just the word sit or just the word lie down. I actually like to say the word chill or crash. Um, but not multiple words and not good dog. And, and the more words we use, the harder it is for them to understand when we're in a training capacity. So we're going to start uh, petting the dogs with a purpose. And even if we just want to pet the dog, uh, Louie, sit. Sit. So in that case, Louie didn't do what I wanted, so I didn't give him any attention. If I would add a treat, I would have given her the treat and not Louie. And that's actually a good little technique you can use as well. The guardians don't use a lot of treats. I like to see them using them more, but using them more in a structured way. So I might have a treat and say, come. One of the first dogs that comes over and sits in front of me gets the treat, whoever comes second and third don't get anything. When I get two dogs that come at the same time, then I give two treats because they're giving the same effort. But right now, the dog that comes last has this, gets the same reward that the dog that comes first. And so why should I bother? Also, when we're petting one dog, sometimes the other dogs come up. And that's something we want to disagree with as well. I usually hold the, the approaching dog at, the, at, uh, at a stiff arm and continue petting the first dog. And if the first, second dog doesn't uh, protest, when I get done, I give it my full attention. But if it protests, I don't give it any attention. Now, in the other, I, one of the videos that I, I think I'll post too, uh, we went out and covered Louie's uh, tells, the things that he's going to do to communicate that he's disagreeing. Again, we want to disagree with him as soon as he does those things consistently, so he starts to see that humans have it under control. They're controlling the social interaction. I don't need to do that anymore myself. Because uh, eventually, one of these days, it's gonna, not gonna stop with a quick little correction, and he's not as big as she is. So we don't wanna have the dogs working them out or uh, resorting to aggression at all. We wanna provide good, clear, concise leadership that's dispassionate and, like I said, consistent. So the more we enforce the rules and boundaries, the more we can do that. I'd also like to pet the dogs, uh, uh, use passive training to reward desired actions and behavior. So anytime the dog comes to us, pet it and say, come. Every time the dog sits down, we pet it and say, sit, and so on and so forth. Um, I'd like the guardians also to start claiming their personal space, a one foot bubble of personal space. Nothing wrong with the dog being in your lap if you invite the dog up. Right now, these dogs are making the invitations. And however the dogs interact with their humans is how they're gonna interact with everybody else. So we need them to understand that it's not their position to jump up. They all have, need to wait for an invitation. 
Um, I demonstrated how to claim the area around the door in one of the videos, and I would recommend the guardians practice that with each other, preferably the people in the house, because we have a different dynamic here which could get out of control. And again, we're going to practice with one dog at a time and eventually build the two dogs and then the three dogs, as I described in that video. Scroll up above and you can watch that video if you haven't already. Um, also, for feeding them, I'd like to see them uh, add structure to meal time. So we're going to feed the dogs one at a time, after the human eats first. When the dog takes its first bite of food, we're going to give that dog a unique command word. Grub, chow, feast, supper, dinner, meal, comida, whatever you want to say. When that, do when that dog takes its first bite, it always hears that same command word. That way we can come up with a separate command word for each dog. I would also come up with a separate release dog word for each dog. Um, if we're going to make the dog sit before we let him in or out the door, maybe we say freedom with one dog, uh, release with one dog, and break with another dog. And so after we do that, when that dog, when we give that dog permission to go through the door for the first month where you pass a training, every time it walks through, we're going to say release, release, you know, just once, but each time it goes through. And after a month or two, we say release, and that only means something to that dog. The other two dogs can stay seated. This gives us the ability to control our dogs with a little bit of structure. Um, and once the dogs... Come. Once the dogs will start to um, sit at the door automatically as their way to say, I want to go outside, then we can uh, add to it. We can actually make them wait when we throw the door wide open, but they're not allowed to go out until they get their release work. That's another way to develop more self-control. Um, if the dogs like doing something and they really are into it, we can use training without treats by simply making them do something first before we do something that they want to do. So uh, Louie, I believe, is the fetcher. He likes to fetch. So when he comes back and drops the ball, I might tell him to sit and wait for him to calm down. Then I throw the ball. So if you're going to play the game, you're going to play it by my rules, and I'm going to ask you to do something before I do something that you want. And this is a great way to help the dog, help shift the leader follower dynamics so that the dog looks at the human as the one. I have to pay them. I have to do something respectful for them uh, in order to get my way. I'd also like the guardians to use the escalating consequences that I went over. I'm not going to go over them here. If you go to doggoneproblems.com and click on the dog training tips page, you can find on um, the search box, I believe it's on this side of the page, um, and you can go ahead and type in uh, escalating consequences. You can watch a number of videos where I've covered those. Um, am I forgetting anything? Oh, counter conditioning. We want to use the counter conditioning technique where we're going to let the dog chew on a treat and then we're going to ring the doorbell or say knock at the door or the squeaking sound or what anything that the dogs react to. Remember when we're doing that, we want to increase the distance or lower the intensity. So in this time, I tried to increase the distance by moving Louie away, but he was so worked up, he wasn't interested in the treat. And that's one of our indicators. That means that he is too, it's too intense for him. So we might want to practice this with him in the basement or with somebody holding a pillow over the, uh, over the speaker that the uh, alarm, uh, the doorbell comes out of so we can lower the volume. Once he can get him to take five treats in a row at that distance, then we move him one step closer and keep practicing. Now we're not going to accomplish this all in one sitting, it's going to be a whole bunch of times. Make, take note of where you were when you stopped the last time, and then you go back to that same point, and each time you won't, may take one, two, three steps closer, eventually be on the stairs, eventually be here, eventually be right next to it, and then they no longer react to it. That's the first process of taking away the excitement that causes them to get out of balance. Then we can practice answering the door as I described in the video. Again, one at a time is going to be a little bit easier. We can also put the dogs in a position to succeed by draining their energy before we do these sort of exercises. Just make sure whenever you do that, you give them a recovery period so they're not panting like this uh, or all worked up because that's, you know, just like us, we're out of balance. We're not going to be our best. Isn't that right? It's like, yes, it is. All right. Um, I'm sure I'm probably forgetting some things, but the guardian can always call or text me if she has any questions. I'm always available to my clients. I don't care if it's a couple of days after, this, after the uh, session or a couple of years after the session. Call or text me. I usually can help you if you do it right away. Don't wait. Clients that typically need more than one session, they wait six months and then they call me and it's become a full-blown habit. So sooner rather than later. All right. That is uh, the roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it.